Do you have a car in the D.C. metro area? I do, and sometimes it can be a real bummer. But that's why there's Car Care to Go. Car Care to Go is the future of car maintenance and repair, and it's now as easy as ordering groceries online. They'll pick up your vehicle from your home or office and bring it back when the work is done. You can get your first synthetic oil change for $20.23 with the code FIRST20. Book now at carcaretogo.com. This is what DC is talking about. We've got a new museum that's going to open under the Lincoln Memorial, under it. And the DC metro area is banding together to form a new fair housing plan. I'm here with audio producer Julia Karen and newsletter writer Kayla Cote Stemmerman to talk all about it. Today is Friday, February 24th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and this is CityCast DC. Julia, tell us about what's... So this is like super Book of Secrets, uh, (laughs) a movie style. What's happening under the Lincoln Memorial? All right. always wanted to say that word. I know, right? So... Fun fact, there is a bunch of space under the Lincoln Memorial. It has a fancy name. It's called an Undercroft. I did not know that that was what it was called, but here we are. Sounds like a bad like 19th century euphemism for something private. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But currently, it's just filled with rows of like tall concrete columns and open space that's basically been hidden from the public forever, but potentially... That is about to change because the National Park Service announced that there's going to be a 15,000 square foot immersive museum that's going to be underneath the Lincoln Memorial. I don't know that that's been done anywhere else or that it could be done anywhere else. So this is pretty cool. What does immersive museum mean? I mean, in this case, like, are they they're literally immersed in the <laughs> reflecting pool? But... You can literally touch the columns and the slabs of concrete. It's a it's a it's a touch and feel situation. No. So per Parks and Rec, when they say immersive, it means like. They're going to glass off and wall off some of the concrete so you can see it, like you're immersed underneath it. But they're also going to use like projector screens to project presentations from like historical events onto the foundations of the building, which is really, really cool. So you're like underneath the memorial and you're surrounded by like all the history. And that is how it's immersive. Additionally, what it's supposed to highlight is figures who have shaped the history of the memorial, so civil rights leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., singer Marian Anderson, and why like the Lincoln Memorial was the backdrop of those events. But it's also going to explore basically how they built this museum, President Lincoln's history. Wait, th- there's going to be a museum about how they built the museum? Basically. <laughs> that is like so immersive. It's, it's like ex- meta immersive. Extremely immersive and extremely meta and very like we agree. But look, this is so interesting because, you know, we have uh, on this show, it's been a, a subject we've talked about. I wrote a, my political column about it that you know, we are as a country, we are out of mall. We have a, a dangerous shortage of mall. And so there's been all of this sort of political scrumming over which of the monument proposals get to go there and which don't, which museums should get to go there and which shouldn't because there's not enough space. But this is one fix, which is if there's not enough space on the mall, maybe there's some space, get this, under the mall. Exactly. It's like a sewer sewer basement city situation, you know, in terms of cost, because I think all of us are thinking like, well, like this seems cool. It expands the mall in a way that we didn't know it was possible. What is it going to cost and when is it going to open? Well, it's slated to open in 2026, which would be the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. That's pretty cool. Can you say the Latin word for that? Independent. It's the bicentennial with 50. What is that? I don't know. Oh, I come on. don't know Latin. It's fine. <laughs> don't worry about it. It is also projected to cost $69 million. <laughs> Those sweet, sweet tax dollars at work for an Undercroft Museum. Wait, so Kayla, why don't you predict for us, like you're our maven of events. Is this going to be a thing that becomes a big DC attraction? Well, I hope so. I think a lot of people go to the Lincoln Memorial as one of their first things that they do in D.C. It's, I mean, it's a huge tourist attraction. And there's not a lot to do there besides, you know, sit on the steps, admire the view, and then you want something to do after that. And I think this provides that outlet and also will hopefully tell some interesting untold history of, of you know, the area of the mall. Yeah, I'm excited for it to open. I definitely want to go. What about you guys? Will there be smoothies? <laughs> 
I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I feel What's like in the gift shop. <laughs> I feel like one of the things about DC is that only kids know is the mall is big and it doesn't have a lot of shade, and mm. your parents' legs are long, so they don't notice this. <laughs> but as a kid, you're just you're walking and you're walking and you're walking and like. There's nothing, you know, like the ice cream's all overpriced, so your parents don't want to pay for it. I'm, I'm speaking very personally here. I was going to say. Oh, no, I've had this experience, but too. But the more, like, quirky, shady, possibly air-conditioned places they can build in, the better, as far as I'm concerned. That's true. I and this agree. does provide shade. Hopefully, there's a smoothie stand and a gift shop that will be really, really cool. And it's free to the public, right? As far as we know, yeah. Okay. We do a feature called The Bigger Picture, where we take a sort of small thing in the news and explain or talk about why it actually matters beyond itself. There's a story in the Business Journal that I thought was really interesting about how a bunch of the governments in the region, that it is to say the local ones, D.C. And, and Montgomery County and Fairfax County and so on, they are all on the hook for every year showing the feds a plan about fair housing, how they are going to promote fair housing. This is one of the conditions of a bunch of the federal money through HUD and other things that flows to states and counties and cities. This year, they have a bunch of these local governments have jointly gotten together to work on a fair housing plan and uh, involved like a big study of housing in the region. And the sort of headline here is what they've found is that segregation, both black white segregation and white non white segregation, have become more pronounced in the last decade. It had been getting better for a little while and it ceased to get better and it became worse. The way they measure this is like, what percentage of residents would have to move to a new neighborhood in order to have the populations equally distributed? And it's like, on one level, it's shocking. On another level, it's not surprising at all. The, the story is that the affordable housing crisis in the entire region is manifesting itself in increasingly strong racial segregation in housing. And I don't know, did you guys uh, look at that story? Yeah. So one of the things that this group came together on is that there were four big reasons for why there is this housing crisis in the first place. And if you've listened to CityCast DC before, you know that some of these reasons are fair. There's a lack of affordable housing options. There's zoning and land use regulations that restrict where housing and particularly affordable housing can go. There is discrimination by landlords against tenants who use those federal housing vouchers or any kind of public assistance. And then there's a lack of consequences for the landlords who practice that discrimination. So I think my big question is, what are their remedies for some of this and how do they implement them? Right, what's been made public so far is the executive summary. So it's not full of wonky details of that. And whatever plan they come up with actually has no teeth unless the feds were to say, like, guys, uh, unless you live up to your plan, you can't have this money, uh, which uh, I suspect won't happen. One of the mayor's huge pushes is to get, you know, her, her new economic plan for D.C. is getting more black homeowners and having all of these different incentives for that. Do you think that will make a difference at all? I mean, I'm sort of a pessimist about this. Um, in that I think a lot of these small things make differences around the margins, but Washington, the city of Washington, has always been an awfully segregated place. And, and what integration has happened often happens when like one group is coming and the other one is going. And so there's like a period of some years when there's overlap. I was really psyched to see this report specify the phenomenon of nimbyism, mm. because I think like one of the ways that like affordable housing doesn't get built or just how more housing in general doesn't get built. It's not because, you know, right now in 2023, you can't have a situation where snooty neighbors are saying like, we grew up in our neighborhood or we don't want you to build housing for members of this or that group that we don't like. What they'll say is like, hey, this is a neighborhood of two and three story houses. Building a Building a taller, bigger rental building would be out of character with the neighborhood. And they couch it as like a architectural dissent, you know, like, and who could have, you know, it's just architecture. Everyone's got a right to an opinion, right? But the effect is that that it, it lessens the supply of housing, which makes housing more expensive, which is particularly hard on uh, poorer people. 
I just think it's fascinating to see them point out like, yes, you know, like we do need to have more housing. We have some idea of the remedies, which are like increase the supply of affordable housing, like change some of the zoning, stuff like that. But again, like until they actually do something about it and implement it and give it, as you said, teeth, like, do we think this is going to go anywhere? I mean, look, I, this is a country where a lot of taxpayer money flows to a lot of governments and uh, attaching strings there. You know, it's in one way, it's very effective because it's a bureaucracy and the bureaucracies will do what they got to do. On the other hand, all of this sort of quiet nudging that happens here and there keeps the big issue out of out of public conversation. We sometimes act as if like both the building of uh, quote unquote affordable housing and integrating of neighborhoods in general is a matter of like the goodwill and like decency and humanity of the various like landlords and tenants and neighbors involved. But it, it's a little wonkier than that, I think. So we know that this is a problem. One thing that is also cool that I've noticed, there's a public comment period on this until March 31st. So if you are one of the people that lives in Montgomery County, the D.C. metro area, there is a form online. You can give input. We will include that in our show notes. Are you guys going to fill out that public comment form? Now I will. <laughs> um, all right. Wait, Kayla, tell us, speaking of things you will do, give us a preview of the weekend. Um, we're going from hot to maybe cold. Absolutely. Um, but what should we do other than fill out that public comment form? Yeah, so go fill out that form, and then tonight you should head to this fundraiser for Ukraine at Dacha Beer Garden, which is in Shaw. It starts at 2, but it goes until 9 p.m., and it's a great fundraiser for the Sunflower Network, which supports families in Ukraine on the ground. It's going to be great. There's going to be lots of beer, lots of games, lots of activities to do. Good way to start your weekend. Then tomorrow, there's lots of crafty sorts of things happening at Solid State Books on H Street. There's going to be a puzzle swap. Uh, so for you puzzlers, you can bring your old ones that are boring for you to do now, and you can get new ones. Hopefully, they're not missing any pieces. I hope nobody does that to you. That would be tragic. And there's also a crochet class tomorrow. So if you are looking for a new hobby, you can go to... Capitol View Neighborhood Library, which is in Southeast, and learn how to crochet from somebody called Miss Darlene. And it's free. It actually takes place this fourth Saturday of every month. So if you miss this one, you can go to another one. If you start and it's not going so well, you can go back for help. It's a really great resource. And then two more things. One is on Sunday. We have a Cheers and Beers Black Brewers Tasting Event. So this is from 2 to 5 at Metro Bar in Northeast on Sunday. And there's going to be black brewers from all around the DMV, Maryland and Virginia. Breweries like Black Beauty Brewing, Leon Harris, Soul Mega Brewing, Urban Garden Brewing, some of the best, really the best in the area for you to taste. It's $20 for unlimited tastings. And it sounds really fun. If you haven't been over to Metro Bar, I highly recommend. It's a great vibe and a great way to spend your Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I'm a frequenter of the trivia at Metro Bar, which happens on Thursdays. And if you want a beer in the middle of an old school Metro car... This is the bar yeah, for you. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting... So while it's snowing this weekend, yeah. you can have the experience of drinking a beer in an old school metro car. Exactly. And they have falls. heaters. Very importantly, it's outside, oh, but they have heaters and blankets and all the things that you might need to stay warm. Wait, can we yeah. rewind to the old school metro car for a second? Yeah. Like, what do you mean by that? It's like a 1000 series and, and it's all like 70s out. So they literally just like grabbed a Metro car, like one of the, I think it's like one of the 5,000 series-ish ones, like with ones with the carpet and stuff, which I consider older. And they just like clopped it in the middle of the thing. I love the vibe of Metro Bar. If you've always wanted to, you know, be able to drink in a Metro car while it's snowing outside and have a blankie. This is your time. This is the time. It's the time. Any, any of you guys go into any of these things? I'm going to, I might frequent that Black Brewing event. What about you guys? Honestly, I'm a huge crafter. I'm going to hit up the crafting things. Huge fan. And I also want to mention one more thing, speaking of snow, before we go, is that 
The Yards Park by Navy Yard is having their Ice Yards Festival. So if you're really in the mood to get wintry, this is for you. You get, it's $15, but you have, you get so much. You get, you know, specials from all of these restaurants nearby. There's axe throwing, there's ice carving, there's fire pits, there's a snowboard simulator, whatever that means. And there's iceless curling. Again, whatever Wait, that how, means. How does one do iceless curling? I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, maybe I have to go to find out or maybe you, one of you can go and tell me what happens. Ooh. But it looks like it's really going to be a blast. And after this hot, weird weather, I'm really ready to at least pretend to have some snow. No. Well, I hope you guys keep warm out there or cool, depending on which day we're talking about. <laughs> over the um, because things are insane weather wise. All right. And here's our exciting CityCast tip of the day. You should always check if student discounts are available because they are on so many things. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. Our lead producer is Priyanka Tilve. Our producer is Julia Karen. Our roving producer is Natalie Rivera. Our newsletter writer is Kayla Cote Stemmerman. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. And for goodness sakes, tell everyone on the Metro car about it, whether it is an actual Metro car or a novelty bar Metro car. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. It's one of those things where it's like instead of people slumped over because they've had too much to drink or there's puke on the ground or, you know, people are... You know, Wait, have you like, sorry, have you literally seen puke on the ground in the metro? Yes. Really? It's gross. <laughs> Zero out of 10. Like do the, not recommend. I have also. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I, I always feel like the metro is like not a it's a it's such a well-behaved realm. And the, the puke, you know, people save that for Ubers or their own cars <laughs> or whatever. Mm. You'd be surprised.